Gospel reading this morning comes from John, chapter 21, verses 24 and 25. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. May God add his blessing to his, this understanding of his word. You're all off the hook today because Toby has already volunteered to do this, the prayer for the preacher. Did anybody else have one ready, though? Was anybody going to take the plunge this morning? Apparently not. So, Mrs. Toby, God bless you, girl. Advent in Lent, a prayer for our pastor. As we gather in your house today, Lord, we are reminded of the candles of Advent, candles of hope, peace, joy, love, and finally, Jesus Christ. Advent was the beginning of our pilgrimage to find you, dear Lord. Now, in this season of Lent, we find ourselves on a journey destined to bring us, each like your son, to our own day of reckoning. Our journeys are made easier, more meaningful, more purposeful by those with whom we travel. Leaders play an integral part in shaping and informing our journeys. Today, Lord, we ask for your blessings on our leader on this journey, Pastor Terry. With every cherry blossom bursting from its winter respite, may you gift Pastor Terry with the hope of eternal tomorrows. As the songbirds sing in the morning light, may you gift Pastor Terry with the peace of knowing you have put the world in order and you travel with us too. In the long shadows that fall in the late afternoon, may you gift Pastor Terry with the joy of good friends and a loving family. While the world around us bustles with life sometimes lived without direction, may you remind Pastor Terry that she is loved and appreciated for her dedication to facilitating our faith journeys. As we travel together towards that day, we might truly know Jesus Christ. We ask that you bless Pastor Terry with the gift of inspiration so that she may guide us with truth and grace in your name. In all these things, we pray to you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. And you all don't have to be that eloquent. Toby is a writer. Thank you. Oh, I get a copy of that. That's great. We're talking about the cherry blossoms. And yesterday I was driving home from church. I heard the spring peepers. I don't know what spring peepers are, don't you? You guys know what a spring peeper is? They're frogs that sing. The frogs are singing, which means that spring is really here. My goodness. All right. Now, I've told you, I think, that it's been hard for me to put up a Christmas tree since my husband died. I don't know why it would be so hard, but it's been difficult to decorate it. So the last two years, Kara, our administrative assistant, her daughters have come to decorate my tree for me. And they got out my ornaments, and they're fascinated by one. I think I'm going to will it to them when I go into the great beyond, but it's a little tiny Bible, a little teeny tiny Bible, and it's really the Bible, and all the words are printed in it. You think Jackie's print is small. You ought to see the print in this one. And I think, why would we bother to make a Bible that no one could read? But then again, I think about Klingon. You know what Klingon is, right? The language they speak on the planet Klingon. Did you know that there is a planet Klingon apparently somewhere in the great unknown? It's Gene Roddenberry's invention on Star Trek. There are people who have literally interpreted the Bible and translated it into Klingon in case we ever find the ability to travel to distant stars and find a planet that is called Klingon with people who speak Klingon, we'll be able to evangelize them. Right. Mm. Well, do you know what a phylactery is? I'm not, I'm not slamming Jewish people here because some people still wear phylacteries. It's a little tiny scroll with the entirety of the Hebrew Bible in it and it's put on someone's forehead or they bind it on their wrist by leather. Because that's what it says when we read from Deuteronomy this morning. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home, when you're away, when you lie down, when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Sometimes I think it's easier to do a phylactery or a little tiny Bible or to translate it into Klingon 
and it is to take seriously the first part of that, which is recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Keep them in your heart, but share them with others is what we're talking about today. How many of you did the Disciple Bible Study, which was big in, I guess, the late 80s, 90s? Raise your hand if you did the Disciple Bible Study. You're not going to raise your hand because you're afraid I'm going to ask you a question, right? <laughs> because it got you through 80% of scripture. One of the leaders of that group that put it together was Dr. Albert Altler, who has since gone on to be with Jesus full-time, I'm sure, because he was elderly when he did this Disciple Bible Study. He is the person who came up with something called the Wesley Quadrilateral. If you've been to seminary or you've tried to be ordained in the United Methodist Church, you know what the Wesley Quadrilateral is. It's nothing that John Wesley ever thought of or said in his lifetime, but Dr. Outler said, the ways that John Wesley said we know scripture, there are four ways. What are they? Anybody here know what the Quadrilateral, other than Jackie, who went to seminary, would know? The four ways we know God. Scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. And then is that sound familiar to anybody here? Why would scripture be primary? Because scripture has to come before all else. Why do you think scripture is first? The only way we know about God is through scripture. The first way we know about God is through scripture. because it contains the recorded witness of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is why scripture will always be primary for a Methodist or a United Methodist person. Second comes tradition, which is the traditions of the church, which is how we have communion, because we've looked at how our ancestors did it. Experience, not our experience like I experienced that yesterday, but our inner experience, our, our Holy Spirit working in our hearts. And reason is our ability to think and put all these things together. So if scripture is primary, why don't we know it better? Ooh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Why don't we know scripture better? How many of you grew up memorizing scripture? What are some that stick with you from the past? See, you raise your hand, you're in trouble now, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, thanks for the Sermon on the Mountain, very good. Jackie, what did you memorize? Micah 6 8, which is? Don't the Lord Your God. Shall no, that's not it. <laughs> with what shall I come before the Lord my God? With what shall I offer my praise? Would he be accept? No, the, what God wants is us to do what? Three things. Justice, love, kindness, love, kindness, walk humbly, walk humbly with your God. With I really knew it. I was I trying to give her a little hint there. What other ones stick out for you? James 4 8. What? James 4 8. James 4 8? Yes. What is that? Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. When I was a kid, what we're going to have here is called the Upper Elementary Fellowship, guys. So that's going to be for all our accolade aged people who are not quite in middle school yet. This, these two girls, and Austin's here this morning, or he was here. And Megan and others were going to have an upper elementary fellowship. When I was a kid, it was called the Live Wires. Believe it or not, it was a Live Wire. Some of you look surprised. Some of you look like, ah, oh, no, I get that. But they asked us to go home and come back with our favorite scripture passage. Well, Jeremiah's here too. He's one of these upper elementary kids. But I went home and they said, you know, go home and memorize your favorite passage of scripture and come back and tell us what it is. So I went home and I said, Mom, what is my favorite passage of scripture? <laughs> of course I did. She said the 23rd Psalm and I tried to memorize it in King James and I got to the anointest my head with oil. I had no idea what anointest was or how to say it, so I just left that line out altogether. Scripture is like that, isn't it? It's full of all kinds of strange things. And I've had people say to me, well, I know the United Methodists are not going to heaven. Like, really, all of us? Why not? Because you don't use the King James Bible, which is the only Bible, apparently, that Jesus read when he was a boy. <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. Jesus did not speak the King's English. What language did Jesus speak? Here's your question du jour. 
What language did he speak every day with his mama? Aramaic. Aramaic. Very good. I heard that coming from the choir, I do believe. Aramaic. We have one line of Aramaic in our scripture today. What is it? Not today's verses, but in the Bible that we read. There's one line that is written in Aramaic. Do you know what it is? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because when Jesus cried that from the cross, he didn't even get it in Hebrew. He said it in his vernacular, everyday language. Now, it's hard to study scripture, isn't it? Because sometimes it's hard to understand what it means, and sometimes there's really weird stuff in scripture. I told a great story this morning at the first service that I can't tell here, but if you ask me later, I'll tell you about what I did to a friend. I didn't do it. His my two best friends in seminary were men because I went to seminary with mostly men in those days. They called us the Unholy Trinity of Wesley and one got married and asked me to do his wedding and the other was the best man and he said to us, plan my wedding for me. We said, don't you want to plan it? No, I do weddings all the time. I said, this is yours, buddy, plan it. He didn't plan it and he said, pick the scripture for me. Boy, did my friend, his best man, pick a doozy of a scripture for him. We read it at his rehearsal, and people just sort of glaze over when they hear First Kings. The groom looked at me and said, First Kings, really? And as the best man read it, the mother of the bride started going, Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, they can't read that tomorrow, they can't read that tomorrow. And I said, Well, okay. The groom by this time was on the floor laughing so hard he fell down and laughed. The bride was like, Stop it, you guys. There are passages like that in Scripture. The best part of the day was when the father of the bride came up to me and said, that was really funny, where can I get a copy of it? And I said, it's in the Bible. And he said, no, it's not. I said, it's in the Bible. He said, no, it's not, really. He said, well, we're Catholic. It's not in the Catholic Bible. And I said, it is in the Catholic Bible, sir. There are all sorts of strange things in the Bible. And the next day when the best man said, now reading from the Holy Scripture, everyone went, oh. They paid attention. He said, this is from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not jealous or boastful. There's all kinds of weird stuff. There's a talking donkey in scripture. Did you know that? There are lines in the Song of Solomon that cannot be read in a PG service. You'd have to go to the R-rated service for some of those lines. Her breasts are like twin fawns of a gazelle. That's a strange thing in scripture, isn't it? Really, it's there. If you want to look it up, it's there. The thing is, with scripture, you got to learn, and you only learn through reading it. How many of you ever tried to read the Bible cover to cover? Some people try that. They read Genesis and say, that's pretty cool. I know those stories. And they say, Exodus, that's pretty cool. I know those stories. It's Leviticus, and it's like you've been slapped in the head, isn't it? If you want to start reading the scriptures every day, what I tell people to do who have no experience with the Bible, start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start with the Gospels, the stories of Jesus Christ. But understand that what we read this morning from John's Gospel is not one we read in the lectionary. But I think it's important. It's just that short little couple of lines. It says, there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the whole world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Jesus is not in the Bible. Jesus is not the Bible. God is not the Bible. The Bible is a tool. Which is why this week, if you look on our website or on our Facebook page or our Instagram, whatever you get and look at, it's going to tell you that if you find a version of Scripture that is better for you than King James, and King James is not what Jesus spoke, if you know it and love it and all that, that's great. But if you want to understand Scripture, you need it in your own language. Go to BibleGateway.com. I'm giving them a plug this morning. It's a free service. You can look at any written scripture in any written language that there is, and you can find a Bible that you like. And order yourself a Bible, a copy that you can hold in your hand sometimes, even if you're used to doing it on your phone or your tablet. Find a Bible that you can hold in your hand and read and spend time with God every day. And if you can't afford it, call me up and we'll get you one. We do that all the time. We have people who call and say, I don't have a Bible. Could you get me one? Yes. Could you get me a large print? How many of you need the large print version now of Scripture? Some of you are not being honest out there, I don't think. (laughs) But to spend time with God every day is important. And we're going to give you some tools this week online to to spend time with God that will give you some new ways of doing things. 
like Lexio Divina, which even though it's Latin, it's not a particularly Catholic thing because Origen, I'm not going to tell you the origin of Origen, he was the first Christian theologian way back in the day, before there was really a Catholic church, when there was just the believers of God and Jesus Christ, who came up with the Lexio Divina, which is a way of reading and praying scripture. First you read it several times, you see what jumps out at you, and you focus on those words, even if it's one word, you focus on that word, that's the reading part. We're going to do it in four hours instead of doing it in Latin. You read it, then you reflect on it, which means you sit in the quiet for maybe five minutes and let those words wash over you, those two or three words, or one word even, wash over you. The next part is respond. You pray out loud. Pray out loud or pray in your heart. Pray to God and say, God, what is it that you want me to know from this passage? What are you leading me to do from this passage? What is it that I can be for you or do for you? And the next is to rest in the word, which is about five more minutes. It's a great way to learn and pray the scriptures of God. We've got to take seriously what it says in Deuteronomy and what we read in the psalm that was responsibly read this morning. Deuteronomy, it says, teach them to your children and your children's children. And then what does it say? How can young people keep their paths pure by guarding them according to what you've said? You being God, said being what God has shared with us in Scripture. Don't let me stray from any of your commandments. I keep your word close in my heart so that I will not sin against you. You, Lord, are to be blessed. Teach me your statutes. When I ask people, why don't you teach Sunday school? You know what they say to me? I don't know enough about the Bible to teach Sunday school, which is why you should teach Sunday school, because it's going to make you learn the Bible. Right? Did you ever teach anybody to drive? If you ever taught your child how to drive, you, you've got nerves of steel, baby. You can teach them the scriptures. You can learn with them. You can pray with them every day and help them to learn the word of God. Because the world needs God's word right now. But when I give Bibles to kids, I always tell them the same thing. What it is and what it isn't. What is the scripture not? What is the holy word of God in the book not? It's not a doorstop. It's not something to hold your window open if your window will stay up. It's not a coaster, believe it or not. I've seen lots of nice coffee rings on Bibles. And it's not a weapon. Unfortunately, too many people use scripture against someone else. And I've had scripture used against me because when I went into the ministry, people said to me, women should be silent in the church. Silent, 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 silent. And you could find that one line if you want. But if you take it out of its context, it means women should not even speak in the church. How else has scripture been used against people? Think for a moment about that. Remember the Crusades? Remember the Salem witch trials? Remember slavery in America? Justified by scripture. That's when you're using scripture as a weapon against someone else. But if you use it as an invitation to life and Jesus Christ, you will find there the way to be in the world, to be with each other, to be with God, just to be with God. And then you will find your life changing. That's why I asked the choir to sing that song, and you did a beautiful job with it. How many of you hated that song? Anybody not like it? Ancient words? Good, because I love that song. Ancient words? For our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. Ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. Because if you read God's word, it's going to get into your heart. And if it gets into your heart, it's going to change you from the inside out. So I'm going to ask this week that if you do nothing else, you spend five minutes a day in scripture. Or even if you're not with your Bible, you have a telephone in your pocket, a cell phone, look up BibleGateway.com or look up, just do a Google search of verse of the day and you'll find all sorts of things. Five minutes every day. Can we all commit to that this week? Five minutes every day as you're letting devotion? And you will find your heart will be yearning for the word of God. Amen, amen, amen.